The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, Wildcat Night Fight, Tactics and Strategy, Playing Piston Fighters, and Metal Beasts, Anti-Tank Buggy. Today, we'd like to take a break from all those top-notch, high-tech combat vehicles. The Italian tree has recently received a curious machine that we think deserves a closer look. Please welcome the first-ever anti-tank buggy in War Thunder, the AS-4247. Combat vehicle buffs will notice some similarity to an early Italian anti-air machine with a 20mm cannon, but this one has something more interesting. Its main and only caliber is a 47mm gun with elevation angles between minus 8 and plus 15 degrees. The ammo is stored in the sides of the car while the engine and transmission compartment is in the rear. This machine's looks alone are enough to pick your mood up. It's definitely a strong contender for the title of the oddest looking machine in the game. However, its silly looks are a cover for a dangerous predator. The key to its efficiency is the gun. It can shoot two types of armor-piercing rounds with straightforward ballistics and a decent amount of explosives for its battle rating. We recommend going for the ballistic-capped Model 39. It has a high enough penetration rate to incapacitate most enemies from the front, and a full crew knockout is all but guaranteed. If you still need to deliver a coup de grace, you can launch another shell in only three seconds. The wheeled chassis naturally imposes a certain limit to this car's mobility. It feels great on firmer ground, but loses to most tracked vehicles on softer soils. Keep that in mind when you plan your route, because this Italian machine is unfit for face-to-face combat. You probably already guessed the reason for this. Armor. Or more like, no armor. At all. The only protection the crew has is their fashionable black coats. The AS-42 can be wiped out by pretty much anything. A machine gun volley, an HE explosion nearby, and sometimes even by a fierce look, it might seem. Which means that the only reasonable tactic is to pretend you're a tiny little explosive mouse. Blend in with the landscape, work from cover, and change your position often enough for each of your shots to be a surprise to the enemy. That's how you can help this combat buggy become an enjoyable scorer for you. How did they do that? On the darkest, moonless nights, the German bombers would come in waves and bomb the Soviet rear as if they had cat-like eyesight and could peer through overcast skies. Their bombs were dropped onto factories, airfields, warehouses, and railway stations without a miss. How was it possible? Nikolai Goliath, a young lieutenant, had no answer to that. What he did, though, was a shameless violation of an order given by the commander of the 487th Fighter Regiment, Major Mikhail Kuresh. On a dark night in August 1942, he took off in his Yak-1 into the black skies, and night flights were only allowed for the most experienced pilots, only allowed for those with an inherent understanding of the plane's position, since they didn't even have a gyro horizon, only allowed for those who could attempt a dangerous night landing definitely not allowed for a young rookie lieutenant. On the other hand, how could you not take off when you're finally on the front lines in an actual fighter regiment, when you're desperate to prove your worth and even the mechanics are sneering? Everybody's out, what are you waiting for? The commander would have ordered Gulayev to go back, but there was one issue. His Yak-1 didn't even have a radio. And while the fighter's gaining altitude, let's talk about the secrets that helped German bombers with their night raids. They'd actually gained a lot of experience with them during the Battle of Britain. What they'd done back then was bomb beyond visual range. They were using radio bearing. Their planes would follow the beams of several special radio beacons installed in their home territory and navigate precisely to the drop area. It was back in 1940, and the Royal Air Forces did their best to counteract this trick. They jammed the beacons, built fake targets, and created their first specialized night fighters based on the Blenheims and the Bow Fighters. 
The Soviet army, however, was not ready for this type of warfare in their first year in the war. So here was the result. In 1942, the Soviet pilots still had to perform night flights using completely unsuitable daytime tactical fighters. Wait, what was that? As if someone struck a spark in the sky, Goliath took a closer look and spotted it again. That must be flames thrown out by exhaust pipes. Looks like a two-engined plane. The wing is elliptical. That must be a Heinkel 111. Here's two more of them flying in a tight wedge like on a parade, blind to their surroundings. While the lieutenant was getting closer, the bombers did not expose a single tracer. Seems like they felt so confident their gunners didn't even try peering into the darkness around them. Goliath pitched his nose up and sent a long volley straight into the right engine of the leader at a very close range, setting it on fire. It was the wing fuel tank burning, and the flames were so bright they blinded the gunners of the other two bombers. The heavy Heinkel tumbled and fell into a spin, burning hot and falling apart midair. The other ones panicked, dropped their bombs wherever, and scurried back home. Meanwhile, the young lieutenant had to make it back home too and perform the dangerous night landing, which he managed with excellence, by the way. Of course, he couldn't avoid a dressing down from the regiment commander. It was compensated, however, with an award and a promotion to senior lieutenant. Destroying a bomber in a night raid alone in your first, albeit unsanctioned, real combat situation? No joke. The word spread that the guy must be the real deal although no one really knew how much of a deal he truly was. For that Heinkel was the first of his 57 victories. We've already discussed the tactics used on jet fighters, so today we'd like to discuss the piston-engined ones. We'll have five machines representing the generations this time. The Soviet I-15, the American P-36A, the Japanese A-6M3, the German BF-109G2, and the pinnacle of piston-engined fighters, the British Spitfire Mark 24. Let's start with the biplanes. Their main feature is excellent maneuverability with a modest maximum speed. It dictates the only reasonable tactic. Gain some altitude early in the battle to prevent becoming the underdog victim at contact, and start a dogfight, preferably with a single enemy to have better control over the situation. Early monoplanes got much faster than the biplanes. Their maneuverability stayed pretty decent, though, but the predecessors still felt more confident, of course. The first monoplanes can't boast any advanced weaponry, though. They still need to keep the aim on the enemy for quite a while to knock it out which means you'll need to start gaining altitude once you take off. An advantage of just a couple kilometers will enable you to set your own rules and choose priority targets, while lower enemies will have to keep looking around, trying to guess where the next attack will come from. Target choice is simple. The higher the enemy, the more dangerous they are, except for the heavy bombers, of course. Those are for dessert. You can engage biplanes in energy fighting, retaining as much speed as possible, and with monoplanes, you can start a turn-based fight. Next generation fighters have powerful cannons that can down an enemy in the blink of an eye. You can theoretically divide these machines into the maneuverable and the fast ones. The latter are similar to early monoplanes in their usage. You can gain more altitude at the start here and be around five to six kilometers above the ground when you meet your first targets. That means you can also intercept strategic bombers. You don't need to chase them on purpose, but you might as well try to down one if you fly by. Energy attacks with these planes feel closer to the familiar boom and zoom tactics. Approach from above, fire, and retreat to a safe distance with some altitude gain no matter the result. In this generation, fighters like the famous Zero keep the role previously reserved for the biplanes. Start with some climbing to avoid getting the prey roll early, and try to force your enemies into dogfights. Dodge their attacks and look for a good firing position once your opponent flies past. You might have enough maneuverability advantage over your counterparts to be dodging multiple enemies at the same time. Finally, here's the top piston fighters. They combine all the advantages and can be perfect in both boom and zoom and maneuverable combat, but they also face early jets pretty often. Just remember what tactics the latter usually employ and do the exact opposite. 
Climb well and fast after takeoff, and base your actions on the enemies you're about to encounter. You can either employ energy tactics or dodge and force them into maneuverable combat. Your success in air battles depends on your vehicle knowledge, both your own and your enemies. You'll learn more about the pros and the cons with time, and may even emerge victorious from the hardest fights. Share your successes in the comments. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called DG. Can you do a video with the F-105 and tactics for it? Hi, DG. Sure we can. More than that, we already did. Check out episode 283 of The Shooting Range. It already talks about the F-105. Bamboo Beaver asks, What's that thing sticking out of the top of the nose of the Mirage? Hi, Bamboo Beaver. It's an aerial refueling probe. You can also spot it on many other jets. Another question comes from Sack Thing. What's the best tactic for early missiles like the AIM-9, B, or E? As they're not even nearly as maneuverable as something like the AIM-9G, and I rarely manage to get kills with them. Hi there. Unfortunately, early air-to-air -air missiles can't boast very high efficiency, and you can't really improve that much. They were like that in real life. In the game, this kind of ordnance can help you destroy cumbersome targets like bombers, and also force a fleeing enemy to maneuver and lose enough speed to finish them with cannons. Ali Hassoun writes, Does a dozer count as extra frontal armor? Hello, Ali. Yes, the blade slightly improves your frontal protection. You can check it out for yourself in the protection analysis view. And the last comment for today was written by Varys. Could you do a triathlon with all the phantoms in the game? Hi there, Varys. Now that's a great idea. We don't think comparing all the models would make sense since it's obvious that the early ones will lose to the later ones, but comparing the best ones among various nations sounds exciting. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to pick and get Christmas presents for your loved ones in advance, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.